Good morning, church family. How are you today? Good to see you. Uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, we want to welcome you into the family and into the community in the house of the Lord. We're glad that you're here. There's no better place to be than in community and in fellowship. And so we've glad, we're glad that you chose OCFA, Orange County First Assembly, to be your church this morning. Well, Jesus uh, was quite busy in the book of Mark. In fact, uh, and so this is a good illustration here. Now I'm back. Hi, and uh, here I am. Um, and I'm excited, and it's an honor to be here uh, because as I was looking at the book of Mark, chapter 6, I was actually telling the pastors this morning and back when we were praying, and I had mentioned, yeah, Jesus, uh, I'm, I'm in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, and they all looked at me with white eyes, and they're like, you studied Matthew uh, for for today? And I'm like, yeah, Mark, Mark, I'm wearing Mark. Just kidding. Just making sure you guys are paying attention. And so, uh, but I'm looking at the book of Mark, chapter 6, and this is where we are today, and this is where we're landing. And so if you want to open up your Bibles to chapter 6, I want to give you just a, 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 pre, a review, rather, of where we're at in chapter 6, because that quite literally, uh, Jesus is extremely busy. He's got his work cut out for him. Uh, I mean, we, we have been learning and reading through the book of Mark, chapter 5, just in previously, that he's been casting out demons in the local livestock, uh, unclean pigs. He's ticking off the locals by doing that, by the way, because, I mean, they're losing, they're losing their livestock along the way. He, his, he, he, his power heals a woman with a blood disease, as we read, that uh, he'd been suffering for years while he was on his way to awaken a young sleeping girl, uh, showing that her current condition was temporary as he restored her to life. I love in the story because it's like, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And they're looking at Jesus like, are you kidding me right now? Like, like no, we, we know she's not breathing. And he's like, no, 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 she's, she's just asleep. And so you learned a, a few weeks ago, we read together in the church body, if you miss us, I'm giving you a, a review of chapter five as he restores her holy like holy as W-H-O-L-L-Y, to life. And Jesus would then leave the scene of an absolute miracle, restoring a young 12-year-old girl to life, only to return to his hometown along with his disciples where we are parking today in the book of Mark, not Matthew, chapter 6. Although Matthew's good too, that starts the Gospels, but we're in chapter 6 of Mark, verse 1. And a uh, couple things, th yes, this morning uh, I've entitled our sermon, Your Greatest Ability is Your Availability, period. We can go home now. But I want us to, you to pay attention to that for a moment, that your greatest ability is your availability. And we're going to see that as we walk through. And Jesus literally, quite literally models this for us and models this for his disciples. And so there's a lot going on in the book of, in, in the book, I keep saying the book, in chapter six here. Um, and with the first is while in his hometown, Jesus would uh, experience rejection from his own people. I want to hit on that for a moment because there's a lot, again, there's a lot happening here. Jesus is extremely busy. There's a lot of ministry to, to take place here. But I'm going to uh, hit on all of these different things as we go on a journey with Jesus here in chapter 6. Because right off the bat, we read that they were offended. Who's offended? The people in Jesus' hometown where he grows up. I don't know about you, but if you return after uh, a little bit of time, now remember, he, he had lived there for 30 years. So it's only been a little bit of time, and he returns to his hometown. Imagine yourself in Jesus' shoes. You'd been gone for quite some time. You return to your hometown. The first words here is, and you can move on to the first slide here, the first thing that we read here, oh, not that quite yet, but uh, Jesus experiences rejection from his own people. They are offended, literally. The words are offended. And, and for 30 years, Jesus had walked among these people. They had, and yet they rejected their hometown hero. Imagine yourself being there for a moment, you come back and you're looking for like some love and you get nothing at all like what you're thinking. In fact, they're looking at you like, who's this guy think he is? Like a carpenter, like he's nothing. I, I, former English Bishop of Liverpool, J.C. Ryle would write this. It is a solemn truth that in religion, more than anything else, familiarity breeds contempt. Hmm. I just wanted to contemplate on that for a moment because the things of this world that are familiar can easily be disrespected. He too was despised most by those who knew him best. 
And that's where we go here to Mark chapter 6, verse 4, and we read, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home, Jesus would say. You see, understand that the rejection here for Jesus, right off the bat, we're, we're getting going. We're revving our engines right off the bat here in chapter 6 because the rejection is twofold. And here, here's, here's what's happening. Is this not the carpenter, they say? For the first 30 years of his life, our Lord was not afraid to work with his hands. But yet, yet, yet the people of Nazareth despised Jesus because he was a working man? I'm, he's just a, he, he, who is this? he was a man of the people. He was a layman. He was a simple man. Therefore, they could not, they would not receive him. Well, that's bizarre. He, he, was, he was living among the people. J.C. Ryle, J. C. Ryle, and I was just reading on some, some of his notes uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier. It says he cannot be dishonorable to occupy the same position as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Is not this Mary's son, they say? That's interesting, by the way. He says, is this, is this not Mary's son? Where's Joseph? Do, do we not know his brothers and his sisters as they're having conversation with Jesus? This tells us, and scholars tell us, that Joseph must have passed away by this time. Jesus would die uh, at the age of, of 33, and yet he did not leave Nazareth until he was 30. So why the delay? Joseph died young. Jesus took it upon himself to support his mother and his brothers and his sisters. And only when they were old enough did Jesus go forth. He's taking care of his own. He's faithful and little. And in the end, God gave him much to do. Quite literally, what's taking place here in chapter 6. And the result of all of this was that Jesus could not demonstrate his power in his hometown. (laughs) <laughs> that's the thanks he gets. I mean, could you put yourself there for a moment? Could you imagine the atmosphere was wrong for Jesus? And some things cannot be done until the atmosphere is right. There can be no preaching in the wrong atmosphere. And here Jesus knows that they're not accepting him there. William Barclay, theologian, would write, in an atmosphere of critical coldness or bland indifference, the most spirit-packed utterance can fall lifeless to the earth. You see, there can be no peace making in the wrong atmosphere. We can either help or hinder the work of, of Christ, and we can open the door wide to him, or we can slam it in his face. And Jesus experienced just that, with his own people. They, they are offended by his presence. And Jesus goes, okay. The prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. That's what, what's happening here. So Jesus would continue teaching from village to village as we read in verse 6. And as he did, he, as we continue to see, Jesus sends out his disciples two by two, to preach the gospel, to drive out demons, and to heal the sick. Let's let's park there for a quick moment. Mark is the only one, by the way, who mentions this pertinent detail of going out two by two. Did you know that? This is all four gospels, but Mark's, 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 Mark's paying attention to this piece here. They're just, hey, he's in the mountain two by two. Obviously, we read in scripture, uh, Two are, are better than one. Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 9 tells us that. We, we, we know in Scripture that iron sharpens iron. We, we can accomplish much more together. We're better together, right? Those slogans. Like, we also understand that there's power and fellowship and community coming, to the, coming here, coming in the present. There's nothing replaces this. And, but we're grateful for our online presence as well because that's been a blessing as well when people can't quite make it in person. But nothing will replace being in person together and establishing relationship. And Jesus sends the disciples out two by two. So much good can come from going out together, keeping one another from trouble. <laughs> encouraging one another along the way. The enemy wants nothing more 
than to deter, to distract, and to cause division. I was traveling this last week, and I had the opportunity to go to North Carolina, and I was sitting with one of my peers, and, and uh, we, for those who don't know, I also have a full-time job. I work with Samaritan's Purse, and I was doing a little bit of traveling last week, and, and uh, he and I were talking, and we were sitting together, and he's like, you know, this is so awesome because I work remote, I work from home, and, but, but when, when I'm together with someone else, it just, not only does it feel good, like it takes away that feeling of loneliness because we weren't designed to be alone, we are designed to be in community. He's like, but I mean, this is, this is special. Yeah, I work remote and do this and that, but he was just talking, it was kind of reminding me here about this very moment here where Jesus is very intentional as he sends the disciples out two by two. And, and before we continue, I would just like to encourage us that is the Lord leads and gives you opportunities, and maybe sometimes you're feeling a little uncomfortable, and there's nothing wrong with having someone else, another believer, by your side as you're sharing the good news, as you're sharing your story. This is my testimony by the blood of the Lamb. He has overcome. This is my story in Revelations. We're going we're gonna to sing that towards the end. And I just want to pause for a moment because I want to set up for us this morning that at the very end, I have an expectation. Expectation, and that is because I believe the Holy Spirit was very clear that at the end of this service, we want the Lord wants to give you, I want to give you, I'm just trying to be obedient, to give you an opportunity to respond. So prayer partners, fasten your seatbelts and get ready because following the service, we want to give you an opportunity to come forward and to pray with our prayer partners. They're here, they've been praying, they're prayed up, they're ready to go, and I want to give you an opportunity before you leave this morning to come before uh, just the throne room of heaven and to pray with uh, two or two or more t- together, or gather there's, in his name, there's There's power in that. So Jesus is sending them out two by two. Okay, we got to move on because we got a lot going on here. Jesus continues his journey, and then Mark pauses, and he says, by the way, uh, Mark continues uh, in chapter 6 to cover a lot of ground as we learn, and Mark writes, King King Herod has, has John the Baptist killed. Well, Way to just ruin the moment in the very right way to be a Debbie Downer in that moment. Now, Herod, now John the Baptist, King Herod has him killed. Let me just let me just hit that for a moment as a favor to the daughter of Herod's brother, making her his niece of sorts, who danced for him and his buddies in the palace. Let's just say it was very very messy. It was a messy situation, and that this act was really sought out at the request of her wicked mother Herodias. This is verses fourteen through twenty nine. And by the way, King Herod reluctantly really didn't want to. He's somewhat of a coward, but he made a promise, and so he had to stick with it. And John the Baptist, who was paving the way, we read here in Mark chapter 6, that his life was taken, but it would not be forgotten as he paved the way for Jesus Christ himself. So Jesus would continue to perform incredible miracles. Jesus feeds the 5,000, I like to say plus, people. Verses 30 through 44, let's park there for a moment. With a young boy's lunchable, or rather five fish, two loaves of bread, Jesus would would feed the multitudes. When the disciples returned from their mission, Jesus took them away to rest. Sometimes... We don't always get the rest that we're looking for. Sometimes there's, there's moments of a divine encounter that the Holy Spirit has something planned for us. And when we're obedient, back in the very beginning, the first slide, when we said God wants, he's not concerned about our ability as much as our availability. And when we make ourselves available, the Holy Spirit oftentimes has other plans than the plans that we have. And here's a perfect example of that. They are tired. They are worn out. They're going to go rest here And Jesus shows us uh, that to be effective, we need periodic rest and renewal. And here we see that Jesus and the disciples did not always find it easy to get that rest. You ever been there before? You're like, I just need to rest. And it's like, it's, well, we'll get there. Not time. I'll rest when I'm in in heaven or or, or whatever. Right? Sometimes it's like you just going, going, going for days on end. And here's a perfect example. It's healthy, by the way. That's why there is the Sabbath. Sometimes we just got to tighten up and buckle up and keep going because the Lord has other plans in store. And here's a great example of that because 
large crowds anticipated where Jesus and the disciples would be. We read in verse 34, and it's up on the screens, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And there were a lot of them. Can you imagine? You're hanging out with Jesus. You've been doing some work for Jesus, for the Lord. And he says, let's go, let's go rest. And there's 5,000 men, plus women and children. There's a lot more than just 5,000 there waiting. It was late in the day. It was in a remote place. Jesus was teaching and sharing the word. The disciples, I love the disciples because we can see a lot of ourselves in them. And the disciples, I love this. This is good. We're, what's about to take place here because the disciples recognized it was late in the day. Now, okay, Jesus, it's, it's late. Now. It's getting late. Sun's going down. And they suggest that they send the large crowds home so they could eat. But Jesus had other plans. Here we truly see the power of God moving in an extraordinary way. You see, when Jesus asked the disciples to provide food for over 5,000 people, they asked in shock if they should go and spend eight months' wages on bread. Their mind immediately went to, are you kidding me? Do you know how much money it would cost to feed these people? I mean, you're laughing, but some of you all, you know that if you were in there, that crowd, you were in that, you'd be asking Jesus the same question. Like, for real? This eight, eight months, you know, the one that spoke out was like, he's crunching the numbers, and he's like, that's a lot of money. This is eight months wages. We don't have, that would, that would drain us, our ministry fund. How do you react when you're given what seems like an impossible task? And I was thinking about this moment. And I want you to sit here for a moment, a situation that seems impossible with human resources, but a situation that seems impossible with human resources is simply an opportunity for God. Oh, we learned that in COVID. We learned that during a season of a pandemic. Well, that was an opportunity. It's all in how you look at it. The disciples did everything they could by gathering available food and organizing the people into groups. And then, in an answer to prayer, God did the impossible, as we know. You see, church, when facing a seemingly impossible task, may we do what we are able to do and ask God to do the rest. He may see fit to make the impossible happen. But are we available? Jesus could have easily sent these people home, but he wouldn't ignore their needs. Which takes me to this thought for a moment. If you'd ponder, Jesus has considered with every aspect of our lives, the physical as well as the spiritual. Both. He responds with, I love this, verse 37. He's with the disciples. You're one of the disciples in the moment. Vision yourself there. He says, you give them something to eat. What? Give them something to eat. What do you do? Uh, much of the church has taken this command lightly. But these past few years has caused the church to step up their game. And for some, they've paid attention and woken up. They've awakened through the weekly outreach ministry here at OCFA. Hundreds of families, if not thousands, are fed every week. Led by Pastor Alonzo and a wonderful team weekly, Thousands of families have had their physical needs met through partnership at OCFA, has, through OCFA. Praise God for that. Not, a, not to mention the things that we do. We take missions very seriously. We sponsor many, many missionaries around the world because we believe God has called them to sacrifice much for the sake of the gospel. Missions is everything for us here at Orange County First Assembly. My friend Tom Bonner is a missionary to the Philippines. And this week, while I was traveling, I took some time to talk with my good friend and mentor, Tom Bonnert, missionary, like I said, to the Philippines. And he and his family have dedicated their lives to serving the Lord in another country. And, he, and they sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel, like I had just said a moment ago what our missionaries do. And Tom reminded me that the Jesus is, is, here in, is here in our need, both in the now and the not yet. We carry that same good news as we enter into the people's struggle and bring the help they need in Christ's name. 
Jesus helps the multitudes of his true, in his true compassion and concern. And, and as they continue to follow him, Jesus challenges them, addressing them as he knows why they are here, because a need was met. Then he says to work for food that will not spoil. Well, where's that? Well, in John chapter 6, conveniently, verses 25 through 59, he goes on to talk about the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. And in other words, he starts and meets them in their need, in the present and the now, and then he moves them to consider the eternal food that will not spoil, he says. Jesus is the bread of life. No miracle seems to have made such an impression on the disciples as this. And and Jesus' compassion for these hungry people, as I mentioned earlier, is recorded in all four Gospels. And it's the only miracle by Jesus in all four Gospels here. For For people who are desperately hungry, there is no better way for us to show God's love to them than to help to provide for their physical need. And here we see it. It is impossible to minister effectively to the spiritual need without considering the physical need. And that's what my friend Tom has helped me understand. And I want to take you just for a, can we just take like a commercial break for a moment and go to the book of James Jesus, we read about Jesus had siblings, and he has a family, right? And family, didn't, when he comes to Nazareth, they're like, you know, whatever. Like, we disrespected him. Well, probably not James here. James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. I want to I pay attention here for a moment. I'm just going to read it on the screens here. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone, this is Jesus' brother, he's writing, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister was out clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? And in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. This does not contradict. I want you to mark Romans chapter 3, verse 28 for a moment. Go back and look at that. A person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. This does not contradict Romans chapter 3, 28. While it is true that good deeds can never earn salvation, true faith always results in changed life and good deeds. In other words, action has to take place. And Paul speaks against those who try to be saved by deeds instead of true faith. And James, he speaks against those who confuse mere intellectual assent with, with true faith. Because we know even the demons know who Jesus is, but they don't obey him. James 2.19 tells us that. What am I saying? We're not justified by what we do in any way. True faith always results in deeds, but the deeds do not justify us. Faith brings us salvation and active obedience demonstrates our faith is genuine. And back to the feeding of the 5,000 plus, Jesus is concerned with every aspect of our lives, the physical, as well as the spiritual. Everyone present here back in, we're back in Mark, chapter six. Everyone present, including women and children, ate and were satisfied. Verse 42. And in the end, did you know there was enough doggy bags to send home with the crew? I mean, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Twelve. And I was reading that it was custom when, when folks traveled. They all had baskets. But, so it makes sense that the disciples came back with twelve. Because they borrowed, excuse, excuse me, can I borrow your basket? Excuse me, can I borrow your basket? People would travel with a basket um, because they, and they would put their portions in there when they were lucky to, to find those or have those. And so it's not, and it makes perfect sense then that the disciples return with 12 because there's 12 of them. 
And they got 12 baskets. They borrow those 12 baskets. They fill up, and they're heaping baskets. Those, those were their doggy bags. In that moment, they were going to have leftovers for days. 12, 12. But did you read, do you remember? There was five loaves, a few, 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 few fish, right? A few, for a bit, two loaves, five fish, right? Did I mix it up, Pastor Derek? I mix it up. You know what I mean. It's a little bit lunchable. They just had a little bit. And this is the tangible power of God's love in action as believers. Here's what we must remember. And for those that are even that are visiting, that maybe you're still in this process of what does it mean to truly know Jesus? Well, let me tell you this. Most of us in the U.S., they've received a gospel of love, belonging, meaning. Many of us did not need to be saved in the West. This is part of my conversation with, with Dr. Tom Bonner. Many of us did not need to be saved in the West in regards, in regards to food. Thus, the gospel we often bring to people ignores the obvious needs. We want their soul saved, yes, but often we negate the obvious. They need the base level of needs. But we often bring a diminished gospel. Here we learn to meet the basic needs of humanity and then tell our story of how he saved us. Are you tracking with me? Here's the wonderful thing about this story. The feeding of the 5,000 shows us a few things. I'd like you to pay attention to the screens here for a moment as I break this down. There are two reactions. First, to the human need. You see, because when the disciples saw how late it was and how tired and hungry the crowds were, in so many words they said, these people are tired and they're hungry, get rid of them and let someone else worry about them. That's a very passive response. Jesus' response, you give them something to eat. I love that. Because you're sitting there, and you're like, come again? What? Do you understand how many people are here in this very... We were supposed to go rest, Jesus, and now you want us to spend eight months wages? And Jesus is like... The, Jesus is saying, these people are tired and hungry. We must do something about this. So Jesus shows us the urgent response in the moment. What can I do in this very moment? Jesus fed the 5,000 because he really was concerned and had compassion. We can learn a lot here. Which one are you? I mean, I found my, I could easily put myself in that category. Let's just let someone else worry about that. Jesus, I had him, had him, had him. You got a lot to learn. Are you aware that others are in difficulty or trouble but wish to push the responsibility for doing something about it onto someone else? Or when you see someone hurting or in need, you feel compelled to do something about it yourself. Let my heart break for what breaks the heart of God. Some might say, let others worry. It's not my problem. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you know someone like that. And others that would respond, I must worry. I must. In all caps, I must. I mean, I know that if you text must, it's like I'm yelling at you, but I must. Like, urgent sense of urgency. I must worry about my brother and my sister's needs. What breaks the heart of the Lord? What, Lord, let my heart break for what breaks yours. Two reactions to the human resources also that we learned here in Mark chapter 6. The disciples were saying we could not earn enough in more than six months, eight months wages. I wrote six. Earlier I've been saying eight. It's just a lot. Work to give this crowd a meal. It's a lot of money. We got that right. What they meant was anything we have God is no use at all. We don't have enough. And if we do then, that's a waste. Because then we're in trouble, Jesus. We won't have enough money to feed ourselves. 
fear, doubt, feelings of insecurity, worry sets in, and life. Jesus, if I do this, you don't understand, how am I going to live? And Jesus says, you trust me? You trust me? You place your whole life in my hands? Jesus' response, what have you got? Five loaves, of five rolls. By the way, these are barley loaves, the food of the poorest of the poor. It was dry. The cheapest and the coarsest, right, Pastor Derek, of all the bread. He knows. We were talking about this, and you see he's smiling. And they had two fish. Could, could I just explain to you for a moment about the size of sardines? Do you know that they would use these little salt fish as a relish with their dry rolls to make them taste better? Two sardines. I mean, some of you know because that's what you caught when you went fishing for the first time, and you're like, look at this! And you're all proud, right? I mean, come on. And then you exaggerate it to all your friends, and you tell them, I've caught a fish like this big. But you, you caught a salt fish, and we won't tell Two sardine fish, salt fish, and they used it to spread on that, on that coarse barley bread, those loaves. But Jesus not only shows deep compassion, he models faith in that very moment when he says to the disciples, do something about it. I, I, that, for me, I don't know about you, but that comes a life to me when I read about the, the, these barley loaves and the little sardines, and they use them to spread on the bread. And they had 12 basketfuls full. And they had 12 basketfuls full at the end. I mean, that's, that's some, that, are you kidding me? That's the power of God right there. It wasn't much, but Jesus took it and he worked wonders with it. In the hands of Jesus, little is always much. So we must, we must do something about it. We must trust him. I still can't shake the words he's talking about. This. You, you do something about it. <laughs> we, you, you, you do something about it. You're Jesus. No, you do something about it. In that very moment, he models the power and the faith when we place our trust and our hope in the Savior and the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We may, we may think that we, what we have little to offer, little talent, little resources to give to Jesus, but that is no reason for a hopeless pessimism that the disciples had. That theologian I was telling you about, William Barclay, I like him. I like to read his, his, his stuff. The one fatal thing to say is, he writes this, the one fatal thing to say is, for all I could do is not worth my while trying to do anything. If we put ourselves in the hands of Christ, be available and willing, there's no telling what he can do with us and through us. Amen? Friends, what we learn here is someone else's need is, is our opportunity for obedient. A gospel is show and tell, and you can't share unless you're ready, willing, and available. Jesus is looking for your availability, and therefore, your greatest ability is your availability, as we were talking about earlier. May we be available to say, Lord, use me. And I trust you in the moments of uncertainty, chaos, and brokenness, and confusion. God, I trust you. Lord, use me. And I will place my trust in you. I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> but I trust you, Lord. Jesus would dismiss the crowds. We're almost done this morning. And continue to amaze his disciples, by the way. I can't just like stop. I got to finish chapter six here. Jesus is still going. I mean, he, he's not resting. He, know time, he knows time's not on his side. And Jesus, he dismissed the crowds and continued to amaze the disciples because he walks on water. I mean, what? 
I mean, as Jesus sent the disciples on their way by boat across the Sea of Galilee, Jesus would go on a mountaintop to pray, and the disciples would find themselves struggling in a storm in the middle of the lake. Jesus is still on land, and he sees them from afar struggling to decide to join them by just taking a shortcut. I mean, the disciples, they literally, read in verse 50, they freak out. Look at verse 50. They think he's a ghost. There's a, there's a, they, do you remember what just happened? They, they just saw the power of God firsthand. And then they're having a moment and they see what appears to be for them a ghost. But I mean, no, these guys, they, I, no judgment, right? Because I would probably, I'd probably wet myself if I saw, if I was saw that, if I was in their shoes, I mean, you know, right? Like, clearly they were still wrapping their heads around the fact that Jesus was standing before them in the flesh, was indeed the Son of God. But in that very moment, I mean, come on, we all like, we read, oh, pff, the disciples, had, they didn't have any faith. Well, you, put, you, you put yourself in the boat, you, you, you probably do the same. I know I, I'd probably be hiding somewhere. Like, what? Get me out of here. Jesus came to the disciples and their storm became a calm. And with him beside them, nothing else mattered anymore. And the same applied to, applies to us. How many times do we find ourselves in the, in the midst of a storm, stressed out and shaken, longing for the calming It's the simple fact of life that when Christ is there, the storm becomes a calm. The tumult tumult becomes peace. The once unbearable now becomes bearable. With Christ by our side, we can pass the breaking point and not break. When we walk with Christ, we allow him to conquer the storms in our lives and after all the commotion of mistaking Jesus water skiing barefoot on his own without a a boat for a ghost Jesus heals all who would touch him Mark ends there we're in there verse 50 through 3 through 56 and we'll read this in a moment when Jesus, and cross, when Jesus and disciples crossed over the Sea of Galilee and he settled on land again, people would continue to recognize Jesus and run ahead in desperation. I mean, let's read here in Mark chapter 6. We have that on the screens. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. And they ran throughout the, that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he went, in the villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. I mean, they begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Look at the parallel to the woman subject to a bleeding problem for 12 years, by the way, as she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. We read that in chapter five. She said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. We read that in Matthew, in the gospels in Matthew chapter nine, verse 20, if you're taking notes. The woman had suffered for 12 years with a bleeding disorder. And I was like, Pastor Adam, why are you veering off here we're we're on remember we're in chapter six yes i understand but in our times of desperation we don't have to worry about the correct way to reach out to god like this woman like all those that desperately reached out to touch the edge of jesus's cloak we can simply reach out in faith he will indeed respond god changed a situation that had been a problem for years 
Previously, we learn in, in Mark chapter 5, the woman was deemed unclean. She was deemed unclean by society and untouchable. Like the, the lepers also, demon-possessed, they were, they were labeled untouchables by society. And, and, and at that time, in Jesus' time, and Jesus wasn't afraid. And in an act of compassion, we see time and time again, Jesus' power breaking down barriers and restoring lives. Sometimes we're, we're tempted to, to give up on people or situations that have not changed for many years. We get discouraged, impatient, or restless, and we want to move on, perhaps in our own lives even. But we cannot limit God, church. We have to learn to be patient and, and trust the process. Our, our timing is not his timing. May we become comfortable in the waiting and continuing to trust the Lord and not to lean on our own understanding. Make ourselves available. Lord, here I am, send me, but also may we trust him even in the valley. May we trust him. God can change what seems unchangeable, giving new purpose and hope. What are your circumstances? And what chains do you need broken today? As the band comes uh, forward, as we close this morning, I would love to do it a little different. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, that the devil's been defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. I'd like for us to take a moment and respond in worship. As we respond in worship, uh, I'm going to ask the prayer partners. They're trained. They're ready to go. They're equipped. They're ready. And they're going to come up. They're going to stand here and be ready. And after the song, because I want us all to engage in this song together, I want us to declare, uh, as we recognize, we read in Revelation, uh, there's power in the blood. And by the word of our testimony, we, we share, we've got two mics, look at that. By the word of our testimony, we share our story. Friends, we're, we're in a series that nevertheless, nevertheless, we thrive in Jesus. But my question to you this morning is, are you available? Will you make yourself available this morning, not just this morning, this week. God, Jesus has shown his power. Well, we just read about that. And even after this amazing miracle that the disciples experience, they still have this moment of fear and doubt. And Jesus, because Jesus appears, I mean, right? They've never seen that before. Oh, may we trust him. May we release to him. I'll say, God, here I am. Not just use me, but maybe you're in a place this morning. I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to do a little different. I'm going to ask us to stand in a moment and respond in worship. And after we respond, I'm going to invite you to come and pray with our prayer partner. Please don't don't like miss this opportunity. Even if you just stand out, stand up out of your seat, spend time with Jesus at the altar. Let him minister and speak to you, encourage you. Maybe you're in a place where you still are struggling to figure this whole thing out. Today's your day to give your life to Jesus Christ. He'll never leave you for or nor forsake you. We confess with our mouth that he is Lord and believe in our heart. We invite him in. He will be Lord of your life. Our prayer partners would love to pray with you celebrate with you but also maybe you're carrying burdens this morning fear, anxiety stress at work, with family and you need someone to agree with you remember we talked about earlier Jesus sent the disciples out two by two because there's power in numbers that's why we're going to pray with you so I want us to stand in a moment we're going to sing a song called Overcome and then we're going to declare the story that we have that's found in Jesus Christ and if that's not your story yet, then I want to invite you also to come and make that your story, to, to be able to share your story and begin. We want to walk with you and go on a journey with you as Christ transforms you from the inside out. Amen? 
So would you stand with us as we respond and worship this morning? And then I'll, I'll invite the prayer partners, but prayer partners, you don't need to wait on me. You just come, right? You just come after this song. Hello, my name is Pastor Sabrina. And I'm Pastor Stephen. And we're the youth pastors here at OCFA. Thank you guys for joining us for Church Online. We're so grateful that you were able to tune in. If you gave your life to Jesus, or if you want to learn more about our church, go ahead and visit our website, ocfirstag.com. If you like social media, follow us on Instagram or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you guys again, and we'll see you next week. God bless.